Today's guest is one of the top, not only gold analysts, but understanding the entire macroeconomic picture and seeing the slow, but now quick, devaluation of currencies in record time. That's Alistair McLeod from Gold Money. We'll link his website, his Twitter, everything right there down below. One of the most uh, fascinating and well-researched individuals. We're going to be talking about what's happening, how to make sense of it, and most importantly, um, how you can prepare yourself. So make sure you hit the like button on this video, send it out in the YouTube universe. Give us a comment right there down below that says go, gold, go right there down below. And we'll give a shout out to our sponsor today, which is uh, First Majestic Silver, one of our favorite uh, gold and silver mining stocks. That's First Majestic Silver. So we want to give a shout out to them. And thanks to CEO Keith Newmeyer. And uh, it's good to see you, Alistair. It's good to see you too, Jake. I, I have to think someone like you that's been one of the foremost researchers on all this for a long time, it's got to be a little strange just seeing how quickly we're seeing this all deteriorate from inflation to Germany saying their their producer price index 25% highest since 1949, the geopolitical environment. It's got to be a little strange to you to see how quickly this has went into high gear. It's not strange at all. No, I expected it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, if you're going to if you're going to print a whole load of money, um, then you're going to knock its purchasing power, and everybody's been doing it. So don't be surprised to see prices rising. That's as, it's really as simple as that. Now, um, how do you make sense of it all? Where we're at right now? You know, what stage of this decline are we in now? You know, obviously, we know the United States printed what about forty percent of all U.S. dollars, basically since the lockdown started. We're seeing inflation getting out of control all over the place, and and of course, the natural uh, when all of this is happening, there seems to always be a new war when things start to get out of control. So there's a lot going on. Um, how do you make sense of it, and where do you think we are? Um, in the stage of this cycle that you've spent so much time researching on? Yeah, I mean, I think that cycle is the right word because um, and I don't mean in the sense, I mean, so many people talk about cycles and they have this cycle and that cycle, but to my mind, there's only one cycle that really matters and that is the bank credit cycle. And it's a cycle of banking behavior in effect. Um, and roughly every 10 years, give or take a year or two, um, it all comes crashing down. Uh, the last time was the Lehman crisis, and that was in 2008, August 2008. So this cycle has got a bit long in the tooth. Um, and as to your point about, um, you know, how sort of things evolve, um, I think one's got to think in terms of not you know, they're printing money and therefore, you know, inflation is going to continue and it's going to continue and they're, you know, they're probably going to continue printing money and, you know, we've got problems that are going to go out until 2025, 2026. No, not at all. You, The whole thing is um, predicated by this, you know, periodic crisis, which happens roughly once every 10 years. And we're so obviously heading for a crisis. I mean, you've only got to look at the overvaluations of all financial assets to see that that's not natural. Um, you've only got to look at the uh, negative real yields on uh, government bonds. That's not natural. Um, and uh, your point about a war is is well made. I mean, I don't think I can actually tie in the Ukrainian situation into a bank credit cycle as such. But um, this is extremely concerning. And uh, I think that um, it's all part of something that can really trigger the crisis. And the crisis, the crisis will be triggered. And then we have to think, well, after it's triggered, what happens then? And that, I think, is the very big question and a frightening one to consider. So let's talk about what happens then. I was on a walk with my, with my wife the other day, and, and we were just talking about how insane home prices are getting. And I was talking to one of my friends that's a mortgage lender. And he said, people were freaking out that 
rates had went to, I think he said like 3.6% is what they were loaning out. And people were starting to say, well, they're getting way too high. And I laughed and I said, well, you know, I was like, those are pretty low rates there. And then when you think about um, 401ks and how many people, a lot of people in America, the majority of their of their net worth is in their home equity, which obviously is just predicated purely off of infinite money printing and cheap money. Yeah. So, so many people's life savings are tied up either in their home equity, their retirement is planned on their 401k and, you know, the companies that they own are, are all based off of this debt system. So like what happens on the other side of it? That's what my wife was asking me. And I said, I- I'm not too sure. So maybe Alistair will have a better answer. Well, I, I think you, I mean, you, you've identi- identified the problem and that is um, the expansion of currency and circulation. Um, is that that's been driving all financial asset values and also driving uh, physical property values. Um, of that, there is absolutely no doubt. And that will come to an end. And the way it comes to, the, to an end is when the market reasserts itself, when the market will no longer tolerate um, uh, a situation where on a 10-year US Treasury, um, a yield of 1.7% is sufficient. Uh, when there is inflation running at over 7%, inflation measured by the increase in the CPI. And if you look at John Williams' shadow stats, I mean, he reckons it's closer to 15%. So, you know, I mean, basically, the whole thing is sort of horribly mispriced. It's rather like sort of stretching a rubber band until it snaps. And I think that's probably an analogy of what's going to happen. How the central banks respond to the crisis is really, I think, the thing that we need to consider. Putting the, the, the Putin-Ukrainian war to one side for a moment, I mean, that's going to have a major effect. I'll come to that a little later on. But um, the effect, I think, of, um, uh, if you like, a, a crisis, a, an inflation crisis, is that the Fed would have to raise interest rates um, very significantly. Now, we need to understand what raising interest rates um, represents. It does not represent the cost of money. What it does is it represents compensation for the market's expectations of the change in the purchasing power of the currency unit over time. So if you're going to um, you know, sort of lend to the US Treasury money for uh, for 10 years by buying a a, a US Treasury bond, you're going to expect compensation for the loss of purchasing power um, on an annualized basis uh, over that period. Now, quite clearly, um, what I'm saying is that the right yield on uh, US, uh, the 10 year US Treasury should be somewhere between seven and a half, eight percent and John Williams, 15 percent. Now, that can give you a pretty good clue as to the downside in a crisis uh, of US Treasury bonds. And that, of course, also affects the valuation of equities, um, because the whole basis of valuation of equities is not, as you might think, the you know the overall earnings um, of a nation's equities um, comprising an index. It is more money flows. And the money flows, basically, are determined by um, where the returns are. And uh, you get a com- you know you get a comparison in terms of valuation between U.S. Treasuries and equities. So, you know, if you get a collapse in the price of U.S. Treasuries, you're going to get a c- collapse in equity markets as well. And I think we're looking potentially at a um, at a bear market which could wipe out an awful lot of value. Um, and remember also that um, I haven't looked at it recently, but certainly I think. I'm right in saying that in November or December, the level of uh, leverage in um, financial markets, uh, according to to, um, the regulators, was around about $900 billion. I mean, we're talking huge sums here of borrowed money. Uh, And uh, of course, as prices start going down, you find the banks start calling in the collateral and you get a self-feeding effect. So... That, I think, um, is basically what happens. You will get a collapse um, in asset values. Now, what the Fed 
will at some stage deem to be extremely important would be to try and stop the slide in asset values because it undermines collateral values at the banks and the banks then have to sell collateral in order to to cover their their outstanding loan position this was something that was um uh, identified a, a long long time ago as really what drove the really vicious stages in the um 1931-32 banking crisis so um the fed will turn around and it'll try and put a stop to it how it'll do it well, I mean, I think the answer basically is that it either accelerates QE and or um, it um, uh, goes easy on the interest rate scene. And if it goes easy on the interest rate scene, then again, we've got a situation where the purchasing power of the currency starts sliding again. So what we're looking at, I think, is um, a situation where the Fed will try and keep the thing together in the event of a crisis but it will just make the thing worse, I'm afraid. So there is, as far as I can see, there's no escape from the crisis. And then you've really got an argument, what falls faster? Is it equities or the, or, or, or the dollar measured, at, say, against gold or uh, energy prices or other commodities? I would hasten, I would, I would um, be reluctant to forecast um, currency values between, say, uh, the dollar and the euro, or the dollar and sterling, the dollar, dollar and the yen. I mean, obviously the charts tell us something, but um, because everyone is in the same boat, every currency is in the same boat. Uh, so that I think is is um, a partial answer to your question. Um, what it means is that you could get the complete collapse of the currency. Now, whether that happens or not, uh, we'll have to see. And I think that this is where this Ukrainian war comes in, because um, while at the moment we're all obsessed with boots on the ground and um, you know all the nasty things that are happening to the Ukrainians, there is no doubt that Putin has miscalculated uh, in his invasion of of the Ukraine, and um, having made that miscalculation, uh, he's got to try and dig himself out of a hole, and I think that that will make him more likely to uh, attack, um, uh, if you like, the sort of the financial position, the relative financial position between Russia and the West. So far, the first salvo has been done by the Western nations, um, where we've turned around and said, uh, we're closing down SWIFT uh, for Russian um, use, apart from um, energy and oil pay, you know, oil and gas payments, natural natural gas payments, but you know nothing else. They're not allowed to do anything else. Um, and uh, the second thing is that we've turned around and we've said at the central bank level uh, we're immobilizing all the Russian central bank's currency um, reserves. So we have a situation where, in effect, the West has turned around and told. Um, the Russians, that as far as they're concerned, currencies are worthless. I, now, that if you look at it in that light, we can then begin to think how they're going to respond to this. And I think, um, I, I think there is only one thing they can do, and that is they're going to insist in, on payments um, for energy um, to a greater or lesser degree in gold. Um, we know that gold is the one reserve asset which the Russians have successfully accumulated and has performed best by a long chalk compared with the other uh, currency aspect, uh, uh, um, cur currency um, assets that they have on, in their reserves. So, um, you know, gold is king as far as they're concerned. At the moment, at the current prices, it represents around about 23, 24, maybe 25% of their total reserves. They've got a lot of reserves. They've got something like $700 billion equivalent in reserves, including the gold. This is, we're talking about big numbers here. Um, and if, um, if the currencies in their reserves are worthless, what's the point of having them? <laughs> you know, they're far better having um, reserves which are completely gold 
and maybe a little bit of um, you know sort of silly dollars and euros on the side, um, you know, for liquidity purposes. And a point which so few people seem to understand is that actually the Russian economy is in a very, very good place. I mean, would you believe, I don't know how many of your viewers would be aware of this, but the, 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 level, of the, the level of income tax in Russia is 13%. It's a flat rate, 13%. You know, this is, this is the stuff dreams are made of for libertarians. And I'll go further. Government borrowing is only 25% of GDP. Wow. Um, you know, you can trot out figures like this the whole way along. I mean, this is, oh, and regulation, incidentally, if you go into business in, in, in uh, uh, Russia, it's lightly regulated. They don't interfere in your production. Now, it's, it's not the whole picture. I mean, the, what I would say is that the level of, um, you know, of, of uh, the sort of crime which <laughs> you had in America, mafia, you know, the mafia type of thing is a great impediment to business. But putting that to one side, if you look at the Russian economy, it's got a massive surplus because of all its uh, oil and natural gas exports. Um, so government doesn't need to borrow any money. The private sector doesn't need foreign currency. I mean, so, you know, wh wh why are we doing this? I mean, we're the ones in the weak position, not the Russians. And I can tell you that the Russians do actually understand this. I mean, I'm talking about the few at the top. The, um, uh, the head of the Russian Central Bank is a very shrewd lady. She, she was appointed in 2013. Remember, we had the Maidan Revolution and the occupation of Crimea in 2014. We attacked Russia financially for that. And unfortunately for Russia, the oil price fell from around about $100 a barrel down to 30 uh, by sort of end of 2016. So those sanctions hurt very, very badly. They really did. Um, but um, this lady, the head of the central bank, uh, she managed to, uh, if you like, sort out the whole of the banking system. She made it stable. It's not horribly geared like the Western ones, and particularly like the uh, major banks in the Eurozone, which, with which they do a lot of transactions. So, you, I mean, you know, obviously, um, you know, the first reaction of the Russians was to run to the ATMs and start taking money out. Um, and if you listen to some of the Western analysts, they'll say, oh, this is a good old fashioned bank run. You know, this is very difficult to deal with. Well, it is a, a, an old fashioned bank run, um, but it will subside. And not only that, but um, with the skills that they have in the central bank uh, of Russia, um, I have no doubt at all that they will be able to manage this one because they will ensure that the banks have the necessary liquidity in order to deal with you know, any sort of um, encashment of, 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 of deposits. So, so it's, you know, we're looking at a situation where we're playing from a position of weakness into strength. Now, what do I mean about a position of weakness? Um, you've got to look at the situation in the Eurozone. The Euro system, which basically is the ECB and all the national central banks, have been accumulating government bonds in huge quantities, um, certainly since the crises that we saw, the Greek crisis, um, which I think was, what, 2012? You know, from then onwards, they've been doing QE in huge, huge quantities. What it means is that when you get a rise in interest rates um, and a rise in bond yields, the mark-to-market -market value of the portfolios in these banks goes down. So much so that in most of the national central banks and at the ECB itself, at current levels, it's wiped out all their equity. In other words, the whole of the euro system is um, in a position where its liabilities are greater than its assets. Now, this is a frightening situation. So if you consider um, uh, some of the major banks which have big positions um, uh, with Russia, for example, big exposure, um, we're talking about uh, the sort of thing um, 
you know, say a French bank with about 14 billion euros of exposure. Um, now, that on its own isn't enough necessarily to break that bank. But when you put everything together, you suddenly see that that bank is not um, uh, solvent anymore. And there are many, many banks like that. Um, and the problem we have is that we now find that the ECB and the National Banking Network is not in a position to do what central banks are expected to do in a banking crisis, and that is ensure that the banks are rescued. They're not in a position to do it. Um, their only hope is that inflation goes away and that pressure for rising interest rates goes away and that bond yields fall. That's their only hope. So we've now got a situation where any um, response by the Russians um, on the financial side with respect to dealing with these um, uh, uh, restrictions on, 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 on payments through SWIFT, uh, the, uh, the, the um, central bank level with, with uh, reserves and so on and so forth, any small problem that arises as a result of Russia's response will destabilize the whole of the euro system and at the same time it is bound to lead to the collapse of the euro as a currency. So um, that second bit may not happen immediately, but this is, this is the danger that we now face from this war against, uh, you know, that Putin has, has, has escalated. Um, he has made a huge mistake doing that. He shouldn't have done it at all. And he should have known better. But, it, but you know, this is where we are. And I think it's what basically what I'm saying is it's increasing the likelihood that um, the financial war, which has basically been bubbling all along in the background, rather like a sort of Cold War, um, for at least a decade or two. On that basis, I think that um, that is likely to be escalated rather than boots on the ground. That's the only way in which he can actually get his credibility back and survive. So this is getting very serious. And as I said earlier on, if all these currencies, euros, um, dollars, pounds, yen, are effectively valueless because they cannot be used, then what's the point of having them? There's no point in being paid for oil in dollars or euros or natural gas in dollars or euros because they can't use them. So what are they going to do? The only thing they can actually do is to turn around and say, right, Europe, you want some oil, you want some gas. We're not allowed to spend your money, so we'll have it in gold. And I think that is the quite a likely outcome. The effect on that, I think, will be, as we can see, I mean, if it destabilizes the, um, the euro system, then that's probably the first uh, fiat domino to fall. And I think the others, you know, I mean, we'll all sort of say, well, um, you know, this, uh, the euro was, of course, fundamentally weak and it had this problem and that problem and so on, implying that we don't have that problem. It was specific to the euro. But actually, um, if you think the thing through, and people will in time, they will realize that the fragility which undoes the euro will also undo other currencies as well. Yeah, interesting points. Um, I had a guest quite a while ago, long before any of any of this was happening. And on a side note, they were talking about how people don't realize how, how strong Russia is, especially because of the sanctions, because they uh, they have such big gold reserves, and obviously they have so many important um, commodities and, and energy. And you know, due to the the Biden regime pushing out a lot of the U.S. production of of energy, this only strengthens Russia. And so it's this weird situation where um, what you said makes a lot of sense why would they not ask for payment of energy in in gold and germany and the rest of the of of the european countries are going to have to oblige because they need the energy right so it's like yeah. this weird situation where a lot of what's happening is actually going to uh add more fuel to the fire to the euro and to the dollar, because you're going to have an even greater demand from these big agencies 
for gold as well. And then, you know, who knows how much money printing or the need for lower interest rates from the Fed side in order to manage all of this. And you just wonder, um, is this going to just quicken the collapse of, of fiat currencies um, in the short or long term run? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the chances of, um, of, a, of a collapse sooner have actually gone up very substantially as a result of this. And I, the other thing, of course, is that we can't just sort of cut Russia off like that, because apart from anything else, they have got a relationship with China who can do an awful lot of things for them. I mean, they can divert uh, sales of um, uh, gas and oil from uh, Europe to China. Now, there is a limitation because um, the extensive pipe network to do that is not there in the same quantity as it is going into Europe. Um, but they can sell other, other uh, commodities quite easily, which just, you know, transcontinental. I mean, it's, it's, that is not a problem. Um, the, the, the position of the Chinese is, is, is interesting. And um, I saw a tweet from the official news source, which I thought summed it up extremely well. Uh, they said, we are not allies of Russia, which basically means that when it comes to United Nations votes and things like that, you know, they'll just abstain. They won't vote with Russia. Um, they said, but they are, we are in partnership with Russia. And I thought the distinction actually is, it was a very, very good one. We're not allies, but we're partners. And that, I think, sums up the situation very well. So when it comes to matters of trade and uh, matters of political influence within Asia, then there is no doubt that China will be extremely helpful to Russia. When it comes to the international politics, you know, this sort of fora where they're asked to, you know, do you support Russia or not, they will abstain. So <laughs> this is a, it is a, a very interesting distinction. And I think one well made and one that we should really pay attention to. Let's talk a little bit about uh, gold and all of this, because one would think that this, whether it's Russian banks moving some more of their reserve, the more of their reserves into gold, whether it's just now um, increasing their their buying, um, whether it's a heightened demand because they're selling energy in 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 gold, and we know we're in the early stages of an energy crisis. We're only going to see this move in energy continue to to increase. Where does gold fall into this whole picture? I think uh, the way I've always looked at it is, um, for a start, gold is money. Nothing else is. Well, silver is, you know, but what I'm talking about is um, uh, defining money as something which is selected by individuals as the um, medium of transaction of last resort, because you're not going to you're not going to use it unless you really have to. Um, so that's what gold is. And I think that um, when you're trying to sort of work out. Um, Sorry, I've rather lost my way on this one. Can, can you ask the question again? Perhaps Where does gold way? tie into all of this, right? Oh, so right, okay. You're seeing whether it's Russian Russian banks that are going to move more reserves into gold, whether it's starting to ask for their energy in gold. Uh, okay. Where does this go? Well, um, I, the answer basically is that gold is money, and uh, it is the money of last resort, not first resort. Uh, and um, I think that the um, uh, markets will begin to wake up to this. The problem we have is that in the West, uh, we are absolutely dominated by Keynesian macroeconomic theory, which basically doesn't want to see gold. It just believes that they, you've got to, the, the state needs the, the maximum flexibility to manage the economy through the currency. Uh, and um, there comes a point where... Uh, that becomes um, so ridiculous that it begins to be reflected in a rising gold price. And this is what we've seen. I mean, we, we had a, a rise in the gold price at the beginning of this week that took it way up. Um, I think we hit, uh, if I can see this, we hit something like 1960, 1970s, something like that. Um, and uh, we came off, we went back up again. And the thing that's interesting is that 
I think as far as the uh, Russians are concerned, they're probably adding to their gold reserves as we speak, because what's the point of having dollars, euros, whatever? And if they are doing this, they will probably be doing it um, uh, not through um, uh, the London bullion market, but they'll probably be doing it through the Chinese markets, because the Chinese have effectively cornered the global uh, bullion market. Um, Shanghai Gold Exchange is a physical exchange, and huge quantities go through that and are delivered into public hands. So I think that's probably where um, Russia will get its gold, and probably through the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Um, as far as the individual banks are concerned, I think they won't be holding gold as such. They will continue to hold rubles. I, I mean, what I've been describing um, is a situation really where um, it's almost as if the Russians are being driven onto a gold standard. I, you know, I'd never thought this would happen. But that's, you know, this, this it appears to me, is where this is going. Yeah, um, that's what I think. It's so yeah. strange how that is. It's almost yeah. expediting the shift out of the, the present fiat regime. Yeah. Absolutely, Jake. And I, you know, I, I, I've always thought that what would happen is that we would see the collapse of Western currencies um, first, and the Chinese and the Russians, who we know have been accumulating gold over the years, um, you know, would then uh, be in a position, if you like, to dominate the world economically, make their currencies the currencies of international exchange by um, putting them on some sort of gold standard. Um, but it actually working the other way. We're forcing them onto the gold standard uh, through, you know, through central bank um, uh, sanctions and also sanctions on um, on SWIFT. Incidentally, with respect to SWIFT, um, I think that's all a bit of a sideshow. Uh, what really matters is that the banking regulators uh, in Europe and in America um, will ensure that banks do not deal with Russian counterparties. And uh, banks will have to demonstrate on the compliance side that they have made every effort to ensure that they're not dealing with Russian counterparties. Um, that is the key thing, not the closure of SWIFT, because SWIFT is merely a messaging thing. You know, it's just saying um, we have credited your account with X million dollars. Bang. You know, that's that's what SWIFT is about. I could do that with an email if I was a bank sending a, um, you know, a notification to another bank. It, you don't need SWIFT for it. I mean, SWIFT formalizes it as a system and provides a degree of security. Because I need to stop banks settling with each other outside SWIFT. So this SWIFT thing is a misnomer. But the important thing to understand is that it's worse than just cutting down uh, SWIFT. It's far worse. It's because the compliance side uh, under regulations will force banks to ensure that they do not deal with any Russian counterparties. And as for this idea that uh, you can settle um, uh, oil and gas uh, uh, deliveries uh, with Russian counterparties, forget that as well, because a bank will just be play safe rather than sorry. It's not going to get into trouble with the regulator. You know, it's just going to say, well, you know, we would rather not do this business. So. Um, this is really quite draconian, and I think it will provoke the Russians into, into um, a contrary action, or counteraction, rather. Now, how does that affect the petrodollar system? If Russia does successfully start trading uh, high amounts of their, of their energy in, in gold, one thing that I wonder is, is it the domino that makes other countries feel more comfortable doing it as well? Uh, it's how does this all going to tie into the petrodollar system? That's a very, very good question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I, I don't think um, uh, the other OPEC members are going to come off uh, the petrodollar system uh, uh, immediately. I think it's something that might happen in time. Um, it's going to be interesting because I suspect that the Russians will end up not selling a huge amount of oil and gas, but it will be at far higher um, notional prices. Because I think the price of gold under this, once people realize what's happening, I mean, we're not looking at, you know, where we are at the moment, which is 1920. 
we'd be looking at somewhere over two and a half thousand dollars. I would have thought possibly even more. Um, and so um, the price of oil, the price of natural gas will have risen along with gold, if you like. Um, it's an interesting one. I'm, I think I think in time that will happen, but probably that happens. The, the, the demise of the petrodollar probably goes along with the demise of the dollar because nobody else is quite in this situation which Russia finds itself in. Um, but there's no doubt about it in my mind that what we're seeing is a situation which is going to hasten the end of pure fears. I mean, there is a way out of it. I think we discussed this last time we spoke. Um, the way out of it is actually very, very simple at some stage. Uh, the central, the various central banks will be forced to put their currencies on a credible gold standard. But you know, if we're looking at dollars, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not two and a half thousand dollars. It's not ten thousand dollars. It's probably something quite a bit higher, because you have got to change the whole system. You've got to convince the boys in Langley, you know, which who are all running the defence industry and all the rest of it, and the, you know, want to control the world still. Um, that, uh, you know, sorry, mates, you've got to accept that gold is king, not the dollar is king. That is a big, big problem for a start. I think also uh, you've got to turn around the whole of the economic establishment, which understands only one thing, and that's Keynesian macroeconomics. We're effectively telling them, sorry, you've got to ditch all that, go back to school and learn what economics is. And until then, don't interfere. So, this is, um, uh, you know, there, there's some big hurdles in the way. And I think that it's unlikely that we'll see a rapid adoption of gold backing for Western currencies. And of course, the other thing is that, uh, well, there are two other things. One, one is that um, uh, the central bank digital currencies are seen as the salvation from a system that's failing. But how long is it going to take for that to get in? And I can't see really how that is going to be accepted in the United States because, you know, who pays? I mean, apart from apart from anything else, if you've got the whole load of Democratic um, senators and all the rest of it, and they're all for it, um, and the Fed has, let's say, said, you know, we've got to do this, and there's a little bit of a crisis, so we need to do this. I mean, the, who pays? The senators. It's, it's you know, it's, it's not their salaries that come from being a senator. They are funded by the banks. The banks pay all their election expenses. I mean, this is huge. So the commercial banks will tell the, the senators and the congressmen how to vote. I mean, I may be, I, look, you know, I'm not part of the American political scene, but this is my perception of what is likely to happen if there is a desire to adopt a, a central bank digital currency. So I can't really see that. Um, and the other thing is that if, let us say, at the end of the day, they realize that they've got to adopt a gold standard, I think that they will try and do it in such a way that it doesn't actually work properly. Because the only one that really works is a gold coin exchange standard. By that, I mean, you and I can go in with our dollar notes and say to the bank, uh, whether it's the Fed or whether it's um, uh, uh, the Fed through our bank, I want to change these for gold coin. A bullion standard is not good enough. Um, by a bullion standard, I mean a situation where, uh, well, the one we had after the, after the First World War in 1925, we introduced a bullion standard where you could exchange sterling um, at the Bank of England for 400 ounce bars of gold. Now, basically what that did was it put the, um, you know, it put the gold standard beyond uh, the abilities of an ordinary individual. It was completely wrong in that sense. You have got to have circulating coinage. That is the key to it. That is the key to monetary stability. Yeah, and, and in the central bank digital currency vein, which is you know a whole other conversation, the other thing is uh, you are not going to get compliance after you saw what happened in Canada with the bank freezes. I mean, there's all those clips of mm. Google and Apple Pay shutting down just ordinary Russian cit citizens accounts. You are not going to get a compliance from well over 50 percent of people, especially in America. But I think that this type of awakening to the destructive nature of of um, 
of a central control over currency to the point where they could shut it off is uh, more of a mass phenomenon that's starting to occur. And as more of these geopolitical things surface and they continue to show their hand with that, it makes you go, well, what happens if everything is centralized? And that's a whole nother component that's, uh, you know, going to be interesting to watch to play out. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, it just takes it, it'll take too much time because um, the assumption, of course, behind it all is that we don't have another crisis. If we have another crisis, then that's going to interrupt everything. And what I'm saying about the Ukrainian situation is that as that morphs more into a financial war, then the crisis is round the corner. It's not two, three, four, five, six years away. Yeah, they certainly expedited everything, huh? So uh, it's going to be interesting to watch it play out. Now, give us, uh, as we part here, give us uh, some of your, uh, let's say, uh, biggest predictions or areas you're keeping the eye on the ball here as we move through the next uh, nine or 10 months of the year? Well, I think I've answered that one. I think a crisis is probably imminent. <laughs> I think it will be before nine or 10 months. I actually think it'll be very soon. I think it might even be a matter of, of weeks or a month or two. Um, this is actually, is I mean, the point about a crisis is that it's suddenly on you. You know, you you might, you know, we okay. We've been talking about this for for years, um, and uh, then suddenly it happens. You think, oh God, why didn't I protect myself? Oh my God, <laughs> I could have done more. I knew it was coming. Why didn't I do? You know, so this is, you know, it's the nature of crisis. I mean, I remember through the Lehman crisis how there were. I mean. I knew it was happening. I knew long before it was happening because we had Northern Rock, which was a building society, in other words, a, a mortgage bank, which went belly up um, in February. And it was beginning to go belly up in um, 2007, around about um, September 2007. So when Lehman came along in 2008, August 2008, I knew this was going to happen. But even then, you know, there were moments when I, through this pro process, I thought, oh, how are they going to get out of this? This is this is so terrible. How are they going to, you know, how are they going to get out of it? And I think actually that that view was echoed by a lot of people who were trying to save the whole system. Fortunately, they did it. And they did it, as far as I can see, by effectively writing an open check, saying to the whole banking and whole um, uh, mortgage system, we will underwrite the lot. This was the Fed, in effect, saying with their policies. And they took over Fannie and Freddie and so on and so forth. I mean, that's now all owned by the government. None of this sort of uh, these agencies, uh, the implication is they're backed by government. I mean, they are now backed by government and have been ever since then. Um, so, you know, your Fed, you know, you've got your mortgages with the government. Um, and uh, when it came to, to, to the banks, I mean, again, it was just open check. I, the potential liabilities on that, I thought at one time, could be as much as 13 trillion. That's what I worked out. And at the time, interestingly, the GDP was around about 13 trillion. So that was, um, that was an extraordinary situation. This time, um, it's a lot worse because we haven't done away with any of the malinvestments. The amount of debt has more or less doubled since then. So we haven't learned that lesson. I mean, the situation is, um, you know, I thought it was bad over Lehman. But my goodness, you know, I never thought we would get to this point. <laughs> and, and if I don't, um, if I haven't got sort of virtually everything out of fiat, before um, this collapse, I will be kicking myself, I can tell you. Well, it's going to be interesting to watch it unfold. We want to thank you for your time today, Alistair. Uh, we'll have to uh, reconvene as we see this whole, uh, this whole geopolitical uh, situation unfold itself and, and draw the parallels back into the financial system. So I want to thank you for your time today. For everyone listening, Right there down below, we will link Alistair's social and Gold Money website as well. Make sure you hit the like button on this video, send it out in the YouTube universe. Uh, give us a comment right there down below for the good old fashioned YouTube algorithm. Alistair, uh, anything else I missed or any uh, last words? Well, um, go to Gold Money and open an account now. <laughs> <laughs>
No, um, I would actually recommend that you seriously think if you haven't got enough gold and silver um, in these very dangerous times, consider your position. I think that's important. Um, and for what it's worth, I, um, I, I publish an article every Thursday, sort of afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. So I've got one coming out tomorrow. So you might like to go to the website um, late afternoon and have a look for it. Um, and hopefully you will find it informative and useful. So we'll go ahead and link all that right there down below. And we want to thank you for listening today. And we will see you next time.